Hello there. It is Wednesday, June 1st, 2016. I'm Jess Lamar Reese Holler, and we're here with Mike Laughlin for the OFA Food Farm and Movement Memory Project. Mike, for the record, could I have you say and spell your full name? It's Michael Laughlin, M I C H A E L L A U G H L I N. Wonderful. Just to start us off, uh, can you tell me when you were born? Uh, April 19th, 1955. And where were you born? In a little town called Conneaut, Ohio. It's right in the northeast corner. Did you grow up there as well? I did. I uh, lived there until moved down to Columbus to go to uh, school and uh, to college and then ended up staying in central Ohio ever since. Can you tell me a little bit about what life was like growing up? Um, you know, it was a very small town, um, uh, kind of Mayberry-like. And, uh, um, you know, we did a lot of um, running around in the woods, playing in the creek, and, and um, uh, grew up, you know, just really spending a lot of time uh, in the country or in, in, in nature and uh, just developed a real love for it at that point. What did your parents do for a living? Uh, my mom was a homemaker and a uh, bookkeeper for my father's business and my dad had a uh, moving business which we were all uh, unpaid workers for our entire lives up there. So, What drew you to nature as a young boy? I'm sorry. What drew you to nature as a young boy? Um, you know, we, we would, um, uh, I, I belonged to uh, Boy Scouts while I was up there and, uh, you know, on through high school up until I left. And, um, you know, we, we, we did a lot of camping, a lot of canoeing. Um, uh, I can, I, I still remember uh, the very first Earth Day and uh, uh, being involved in that and getting a patch for being involved in that and uh, just have always uh, just being raised uh, uh, in those surroundings um, always had a very big uh, concern and a care about them, the Earth and the environment. What were your interests when you got up into school, like in high school? Um, uh, interest in terms of um, uh, what you like, like extracurriculars, what we like yeah. to do is, is um, always did have a garden. My um, uh, grandfather uh, was retired and lived with us at that point, and he was an old German farmer. Uh, that was the old 80-acre method where you would have uh, your farm and you would grow a large variety of different things. I mean, they had, they grew vegetables, they grew, uh, had chickens and a couple pigs and some sheep and, uh, you know, cows. And then they grew some grain to feed them. And, and what they did, they, it was kind of subsistence. And then they sold all the excess to cover their expenses for the year. Um, when you know, I, I always say that he was uh, an organic farmer back then uh, because he never, he just did things the way he always did. He never switched over to um, all the chemicals that were available. And uh, um, he had a, um, a sizable garden at our house. Um, I'm going to say it was probably 100 by... 200 feet and um, uh, would help him with that and and we you know grew a lot of uh, uh, the things we ate every day and did a lot of canning um, and you know when we when I left uh, um, home and went out on my own I, I took a lot of that with me and always always did have a garden and and want to go further with that and and kind of wanted to um, uh, have a farm someday of my own. Um, other things of interest we, we really love to do is, like I said, canoeing. 
uh, Lake Erie was right there, so there was a lot of uh, uh, water uh, sports and fun. Um, uh, did a lot of camping and hiking and, and uh, most, mostly outdoor stuff. I wanted to ask you, um, to back up to a comment you made a moment ago about wanting to have a farm someday from the time you were young or, or in high school because mm -hmm. of the experience with your grandpa, was that part of culture at the time? Did you feel like that was something other young people were thinking about in terms of options? Uh, no, I mean, I, I really didn't know uh, a whole lot of people that strive to um, have a farm as they, as they got older. We lived on the, uh, not in like a, a big city, we were in a, a neighborhood, but we were in a, in a city. Um, and uh, so that wasn't like a, it wasn't like I grew up on a farm and I knew that's what I wanted to do. Uh, I, d I do know that uh, now my had, I had one aunt and uncle that had a dairy farm and each summer for about three weeks, uh, you know, my brother and I, we'd get kind of given to them to work for them for like two, three weeks during the summer and, uh, you know, help making hay and, and uh, uh, milking and, and all the various j jobs around a dairy farm. And, and uh, I learned at a young age that I didn't think I wanted to be a dairy farmer, but uh, um, always did like growing vegetables, so. When did the organics come into the picture? Boy, I can't say they were ever out of the picture for me. Um, you know, when when we when I got married and we had a um, uh, garden of our own, we took care of it, grew it organically. Um, I, because of my interest and involvement in in um, uh, you know, ecology and, and, and nature, um, I, I didn't want to be spreading things that were harmful, uh, either to nature or to myself. And um, I, I knew that I wanted to, to grow things that I was going to be able to, to feel safe about eating myself and feeding to my children. So that was, uh, that was very important to us and and that's that's why we chose to grow that way do you remember when you first became concerned about the fact that maybe things we were eating might be harmful to our bodies or the environment how did you come upon that that awareness yeah i mean that was i mean i i kind of came of age in the late 60s early 70s and it was the whole rachel carson thing and all that and and uh um uh, that really kind of made me stop and think about, you know, choices you're making and what you're eating and, and how you're taking care of yourself. What were the big concerns at the time, like around when you were in college, in terms of environment or, or food and health? Well, I mean, you know, um, <laughs> there, agriculture had been switched over to the, the, um, the chemical model, the conventional model. And, um, uh, by that time, DDT had been banned, but there were other uh, uh, chemicals that were were, were really questionable, uh, and uh, just very concerned about how, what kind of effect they would have on you as, as a consumer, and and just you know, it was just didn't have the the feeling we had at that point was you know I can't say for sure this is bad for you but I'm not taking the chance and uh, I, I can I can grow things without that that I would feel much much uh, more uh, safe in, in, in consuming. I'm curious did, did this emerging interest impact what you studied in, in college anyway when you uh, moved down here? <laughs> no, <laughs> not at all. Uh, uh, I went into and then I, I, I did work for uh, 30 years uh, in mental retardation. Uh, so in, in the social work and, and uh, 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 totally unrelated to agriculture. So 
uh, yeah. When um, when did you first take the leap from gardening organically to becoming a farmer as a profession or as a second job? Yeah. Um, you know, we we. It was something, like I said, that I, I kind of always had in the back of my mind that I'd like to do. Um, I was involved with OFA, uh, seeing the possibility of, of what could be, and and that it is something that's possible. So um, we um, took a huge leap of faith and decided, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna start looking, we're going to find a piece of land and, and, and uh, build our life there. And um, uh, we did. Our, our, our children were, were young at the time. Um, I think uh, Molly was in first grade, second grade, and uh, Emily, our older daughter, was uh, in sixth. Um, so we we made that switch and and moved out here and um, uh, don't regret it one bit. What year was that around? Oh boy! What decade? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say it was about twenty four years ago. I think something like that. So like nineties, yeah. early nineties. Yeah, 90s. early nineties. Yeah. What was happening in the landscape of organic agriculture in Ohio at the time? What were kind of the hot well, things? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, back in the, um, uh, oh, I'd, I'd say back in the mid-'80s, um, it, it was interesting. We, we, I belonged to a, a, a small club in Columbus. In, in Columbus. Uh, it was called uh, the Organic Gardening Club of Central Ohio. And um, uh, one of the founders of, of OFA was a member of that and got me to start going there, Clayton Nepley. And, uh, you know, it was just a bunch of backyard gardeners that, that wanted to raise their food naturally and, and without the use of chemicals. And we, um, you know, and of course, as you're doing things, you have questions about Ooh, how do you do this? Or how can I take care of this problem? Or, or what do I need to do here? And would call Extension. And Extension had absolutely no answers for us whatsoever. Um, we, uh, uh, you had Rodale uh, Institute, which uh, an and organic magazine to refer to. Um, we would uh, uh, go to the old used in antique bookstores and, and scour and find old uh, um, ag journals and, and those type of things to, to read um, to try to find some answers. Um, but then I heard about this new group and, and that formed in Ohio uh, called OFA that um, had a conference every winter. And uh, I think it was like the third or fourth conference. Um, I was finally able to make the connection and it was over at St. Stephen's Community Center uh, near the Ohio State Fairgrounds and um, and went over there to the conference and you know walked in and it was a huge gathering. I think it was I bet there was 150 people in there and uh, had a trade show uh, existed of about four or five booths, uh, but they had workshops on all different kinds of production. Um, they had uh, uh, <coughs> the food that was served there was grown by the members. I mean, it, it was really walked in there and, and kind of found a home. Uh, made friends that day that, that still have to this day. Um, it's just been a great organization. So. Through that and through mentoring with, with some of those, those people I met that day and being continu continuing to be involved in OFA, um, that's 
kind of how we learn to do what we're doing. Um, and it was kind of interesting. It wasn't that long after that that uh, we started getting calls from people and saying, you know, I want to grow organically and, and I'm having this problem. And I called Extension and they told me to call you. <laughs> so, uh, and, and that's kind of happened to uh, OFA in the early years, but they became the de facto uh, extension service for organic and sustainable ag. I was wondering if you could tell me about some of the mentors you found, either at that first OFA conference you attended or elsewhere in your early farm career. Who, who helped teach you or what helped teach you? If it's a book or a journal to do what you, to do what you eventually did. Um, I would say, you know, there's a, n a number of people. I mean, just um, uh, a lot of the different um, workshops that um, from the early uh, OFA conferences. Um, I'd say a, a few individuals that, that really kind of um, uh, really helped a lot in, in, in our early days with uh, Harv Raling would be one, and Rich Tomsu, um, Art Gish, Mick, Mick Luber. Um, you know, they were, they were people I could ask questions of and, and uh, say, you know, I'm looking for a piece of equipment that does this. What should I, what do I need to be concerned about? And what, what, do I, what does it need to do for me? And, um, uh, or I'm, I'm having trouble with this pest, you know, what needs to happen there? So they just were very, very helpful um, in terms of early books that, that I'd say probably two of the things when we were starting out, because we were, we were very small, um, that helped the most was there was a, uh, an old book called uh, How to Grow More how to grow more vegetables, I think, and then it goes on to say, you know, like, than you ever thought, and than you ever imagined, or something like that, by John Jevons, um, that, that it's kind of like a, an intensive way of growing, and, um, uh, and the other, you know, were the early books by uh, Elliot Coleman, because um, that's what we kind of, we started off trying, you know, we, we, we started off growing on, on beds uh, f uh, four foot wide and planting intensively. So instead of having a row of lettuce, we would have five rows of lettuce very close together and then a walkway um, to try to get as much production out of each uh, square foot as possible. And, um, and that's how we continue to grow throughout our whole uh, experience with, with farming. So, With all of the different techniques and modalities available, how did, you, how did you and your family decide what you would grow and how you would grow it on your particular farm? Oh, boy. Um. So you could have <laughs> had a, like... Biodynamic dairy, or you yeah, kind of had you I know, mean, field crops. You, you know, and it, and it really has, I, uh, I, I knew I wanted to grow vegetables. Uh, I knew that. And I knew I really wanted to grow vegetables that when you ate them, you just said, wow. That's, you know, the flavor is so good. And, and so we really started we started experimenting um and this was another this was a uh, one of the early workshops i think it was either at the first or second ofa conference i went to uh was uh, about seed saving and uh, the old heirloom varieties uh so we started we got involved with seed savers and 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 started collecting variety old old heirloom varieties of, of vegetables and trying them on the farm and and uh, growing them and just um, um, just fell in love, you know, because of 
the, the, the colors and the shapes and the sizes and most of all the flavor. Um, we, what we grow, you know, what we started off growing um, and what we continued to grow as, as years progressed, um, it, it changed a lot. It constantly changed. Um, both finding new things that we kind of switched to and then uh, also, you know, meeting market demands and, and, and uh, um, uh, you know, finding things that we didn't know existed before. Um, but the, the, the one thing we started off with and, and continued right up to the end was um, uh, the old heirloom tomatoes. And that was kind of like our specialty. I want to talk more about consumers and kind of finding your market. But before we go there, I have to ask you, this is something I'm really interested in in my research. I've heard you mention the word old a couple of times, both going to use bookstores and finding old books that might be mm -hmm. guidebooks to this sort of practice and also really falling in love with the heirloom seed movement. What was it about older models of agriculture that worked for you? Well, the... Um like I said, there, there, there was no information extension or anywhere, uh, Ohio State, that, that would tell me how to grow uh, produce on, on 10 acres, on 20 acres. It was, it was all large equipment, huge operations. Um, in Ohio, that means grain, uh, corn, soybean, um, and, and chemical farming. And so... Um, the smaller scale stuff um, just wasn't much in existence, and um, um, and in in terms of the uh, you know the like, talking about finding the old books and journals, um, you know when you, you if if you go back and 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 read uh, the extension bulletins and stuff from back pre-World War II, uh, before the chemicals came around, I mean, that's what we were doing back then. Um, it's, it's changed a lot in the past 30 years. Uh, there's a, you know, been a lot more research. There's been a lot more uh, advancements in terms of, of, of natural products that we can use, in terms of equipment, in terms of methods. Um, but back then, that's what we were going back to, that, that base to kind of start, and, and that's what we are finding. And in terms of the um, uh, seeds we were selecting, um, you know, I'll, I'll just, you know, the, the, the one we're, I'm most familiar with is, is the heirloom tomatoes. And, and, and what makes them so special is that they were kept for a specific reason, because the flavor, because of the cultural value of it, because it was a family, it was something passed down in a family. Um, they weren't selected for to ripen all at the same time. They weren't selected to uh, be resistant to a certain disease or to have this certain shape. Um, Whenever you start selecting for a specific person, uh, 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 trait like that, then you lose other stuff. And uh, sadly, one of the first things to go is flavor and quality. And, and, and so that's why people really love the heirloom tomatoes to buy and, and why we just really love to grow them is because... Um, you know, our whole reputation was built on quality and, 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 and uh, uh, flavor, and that's what we wanted to put out there. And we did have um, a little kind of a funny side story was on, um, we had been doing this for, oh, I don't know, 15 years probably, maybe even 20. And we were up at a family gathering up in Connie, up along the lake, and, and uh, my wife's aunt, who lives on the old family farm, came over and said, you know, every year you come and you bring all these tomatoes, would you be interested in 
the tomato that your grandfather grew. And it was an old um, paste variety. Very large. Um, some of them will weigh a pound a piece. Um, but very dense, extremely great flavor, a great sauce tomato. Um, and um, we said, sure. And so we got some seeds from her and we started growing them the next year. And uh, they became probably our biggest seller. Yeah. Grandpa Nick's. That's amazing. Yeah. Can you tell me about some of the other early heirloom varieties that kind of made up your selection when you started out? What, which ones really kind of... Well, of course, the, I mean, the earliest ones um, uh, that everybody knows, uh, you know, one of the first ones to become a Brandywine, Cherokee Purple, Oxheart. Um, those are some of the early ones that, that were, uh, that people first started turning to. Um, they're still very good. There's uh, uh, lots that are every, good as go every bit as good or better. Um, uh, I think when we when we finally quit growing tomatoes, we had about 260 uh, different seeds in our our inventory, and um, um, and I think our last year of growing tomatoes, we we planted um, uh, 12,000 plants. I think so. Um, a lot of a lot of good eating. <laughs> now, you mentioned at one point in time going out and getting all those heirlooms. Were you getting these from seed savers and other companies like that, or more kind of like the Grandpa Nick's variety, finding them through holdouts in Ohio where people were still growing family varieties? Yeah. Um, you know, we, we would have customers at market that would bring us seeds. Um, we... Uh, would find growers whenever we travel. We always seem to find a farmer's market to stop at. Um, and, um, you know, and if I see some tomatoes that I've never s heard of before or, or uh, talk to the grower and get some to, to bring home and save the seeds, um, um, you know, we, we uh, and, and seed savers, uh, we would Every year, we'd, we'd, we'd probably gather 10 to 15 different varieties that we've never tried before. And, you know, and you're just planting 8 or 10 of each variety and putting them in and seeing, you know, do a little trial and see how you, what you think of them. And um, yeah, if they were what we were looking for, then we'd, we would save seeds and, and they'd become part of our rotation. At the time, were you taking a market risk by selling heirloom varieties? Uh, boy, I wouldn't call it a market risk. Um, they're definitely harder to grow. They're a lot fussier. Uh, they're a lot more susceptible to disease. Um, they, uh, but they do sell very well. Um, you know, when when we started, uh, everything was a was a market risk back then because I can, you know, this we would go to the um, uh, Worthington Farmers Market on Saturday morning, and uh, back in the beginning, um, I'd load up my truck and I'd go in and just be me and I'd set up a couple of tables and put stuff out and you'd talk to every customer that went by and you'd walk up and down and visit with the other growers and and it was not very busy and um now um at that market i mean for what we were doing if if you don't have three people or four people there you can't even keep stuff on the table uh there'll be you know two three thousand people through there on a saturday morning so it's it's that whole part has changed and as we um as the years went by 
we grew in terms of our farm. I mean, we we started off here um, growing maybe a half an acre at Your fields most. Fields are out front and in back of the house. Out front and in back, yeah. And we just had a small part of this front field up here that we used. Um, and then each year, as the demand grew, we started expanding. Um, we started selling to restaurants and stores, and and then we'd grow more and more as as um, as, as the market increased and and the awareness became uh, uh, at a higher level, uh, to where you know we ended up uh, growing on on a little over, well, I think. We were about 15 acres at one point at the end. And um, that that was really nice to have that kind of like organic growth uh, of, of us growing our farm along with our business growing. And uh, our, our customers, both our, our restaurant customers and our our farm market customers were probably some of our best marketing people. Uh, they'd go someplace to eat and they'd say, boy, you know, that tomato you have on your salad is not very good. You know, you ought to try getting some from you know, Northridge Organic Farm and we'd get a call. You know, so it, it, it really, that whole word of mouth thing is, is just the best way to, to grow a business. I'm curious, you mentioned the, the awareness of organic and heirloom products that kind of spread throughout the course of your farm career. Can you tell me a little bit about interactions with early customers? Why did they come to you? What were, what were people seeking when they were looking for organic produce in the early 90s? Yeah, um, I'll tell you, you know, those customers back then were, were every bit of uh, as much uh, pioneers as, 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 you know, people think we were. Um, you know, they were there when they when they could go to the grocery store and buy stuff. Um, they they were coming to the farmers market to buy uh, their food um, because they, they they knew what it meant. They knew that uh, the whole idea of you know uh, spending your money where you live. Um, you know, keeping money in the, in the local economy. Um, the fact that, you know, when they went to the grocery store and bought uh, their produce, they got home and, and there's not a whole lot of date, uh, 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 taste difference between your, your lettuce and your cucumber and your, you know, uh, eggplant. They, they, everything kind of, it's just benign. And, and you come to a, and it's, and it has probably been a couple of weeks since it left, left the field. So when they come to the farm market, they know this was probably on a plant yesterday. And I'm getting it today, and it's at the peak of freshness, and, and, and the flavors are so much better. So everything, everything has a distinct flavor. So, um, you know, and, and, and that's the wonderful part of, of, of shopping at a farmer's market is that you know, you might think a cucumber is a cucumber, but you can take four different varieties of cucumbers and try them, and each one has a different flavor, uh, a distinctness to it that, that uh, uh, just makes eating so much more fun. How were the restaurants back then in terms of responding to and working with local growers? Early on, it was really tough, um, mainly because, I mean, you... You would you would strike up a, a, a relationship with a um, a chef, and you'd work with them, and then over the winter they'd move and go to a different restaurant, and you'd call back up, and it's like the new chef doesn't have any interest at all in doing that. So um, it was it was tough. Um, the you know they had some of them had 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 bad experiences where they had uh, bought from local purveyors and and that 
said they'd provide for them but then couldn't and so they would be left in the lurch um, but the the better restaurants a, as time went on I mean and, and the whole the whole restaurant uh, culture in central Ohio has changed as well I mean you know back in the, in the late 80s early 90s it was a lot of you know like brown derby you know uh, chain type places and and then real high-end uh, white white tablecloth places and um, that was it was a, a tough sell back then um, but now uh, there are so many incredibly wonderful restaurants and 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 chefs that you know they want that freshness and they want that flavor um, and and the other thing that that local growers can give them is I mean we had one chef that I mean he wanted a specific size of zucchini and so I'd, I'd take some into him and he said no smaller no smaller you know um, and you know and he, but he was willing to pay for what he wanted but he could get it from us because we could custom harvest for him and give him what he wanted um, you know, so that those kind of relationships build and 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 um, uh, are are a very important part of that. Yeah. Besides the kind of the cultural aspect and the flavor of the kind of vegetables you were able to grow and farmers like you, were these early consumers and buyers concerned about environmental risk or about health? Did the organic part matter, or was it more the the local part that mattered? They they really the the organic part was very important for our customers in the beginning because you know and and I you know the reason we saw that is because we were organic, and and one of the few that was that was there certified organic. The, yeah, so um, um, so for our customers. That was very important. For some of those restaurants we sold for to it, it, it was not. It was more about the quality and the flavor. Um, the stores we sold to, the, the organic certification meant everything. Um, so it, it was a mixed bag there. But um, um, yeah, a lot of us throughout um, a, a good share of our, our customers um, really sought out the organic products. Did you see the um, kind of like general public awareness about what organic meant? Did that shift over the course of, of your farm career? You know, it, it, I think the shift be came from, from more and more people educating themselves and becoming aware of the issues and, and and deciding this is a uh, something that's very important to me. Um, I, I think there there's there's like a two kind of a two prong to it now, and and I think organic is important, but um, I think local is every bit as important, and it it depends on the individual consumer which one they're going to hold and, and, and as more important, you know, is, is what they're going to base their decision on. And, um, uh, but, but both of those things are, are just, uh, uh, um, have really taken off and, and it's, it's just so wonderful. I mean, now, I mean, you can find farmers markets, um, almost any day of the week and, you know, you can go and buy fresh food that you're 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 going to eat which within the next one or two days and then you go to another market and get the next couple days supply so you don't have stuff sitting around just getting old um it it's and there's social outings i mean it's just you run it you know you get to know the the people you're buying from you get to know the the other shoppers and and it just becomes a an event and uh, a big part of people's lives and you know and that's 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 the fun part of the whole movement i think when you started off 
how established were farmers markets in Columbus as a thing that people not did? not very. When we started off, there was really, uh, I, I as far as I know, when we started, there was two. the The Worthington Farm Market was a brand new, Fred fledgling one, and um, I, th I I don't think there was more than a dozen farmers selling at it. Um, and the um, North Market, and that was at the old Quonset Hut uh, before they moved into their new digs down there. Um, and then, you know, some other ones kind of popped up here and there, and, and you know, and, and like I said, in the early days, they were kind of slim pickings. Um, there, you, you didn't ha make a lot of sales at them, but... Um, now they're just they're 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 a whole different monster now. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, did um did establishing Northridge and becoming a part of this whole movement change how you and your family ate or how you raised your family vis a vis food? Yeah, I mean our 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 kids were um you know, they, they helped, they were involved, um they they did the markets. Um, they enjoyed doing the markets, so at least that's what they tell me. And, um, um, you know, and, and, and uh, so we, we ended up producing a huge percentage of, of what we ate in our household. A uh, couple things that, that our, our kids have, have told us over the years is uh, and lately, they they said, you know, you 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 got you really ruined us because we can't eat bad food. <laughs> you know, we have to we have to have good food, otherwise we just can't eat it. So uh, that's really rubbed off on them. They they do shop at the farm markets, um, but um, we always have. Uh, you know, when when you're when you're getting things ready to sell, you know, you, you harvest and you go into the packing shed, and and you you clean and you pack and get stuff ready, and you inspect. And so anything that's got blemishes or or isn't right to go to uh, uh, to market gets put aside. And and we always referred to those as family seconds, and um, that's what we ate. And that's what a lot of our neighbors ate. And um, uh, I can remember uh, our, w our one daughter saying to us one time, said, when are we ever going to get to eat the good stuff? <laughs> so, yeah. But uh, it was all good. It just a, a, a difference in appearance. It's a little bit, a little bit bumpier than yeah. the other. So. Yeah. Speaking yeah. of the, the neighbors, so... We're out here, um, we're kind of on the east side of Johnstown? Yeah, we're about halfway between Johnstown and Utica. So, what's it like, or what was it like then, farming in this community? Because I see a lot of what look like big conventional grain fields around. Yeah, yeah. We were, we were looked at with a lot of suspicion and question early on, um, you know, we we didn't try to hide the fact of what we were doing. Uh, we were proud of it. Um, we tell people, um, and conventional farmers kind of were a little bit leery of us in the beginning, um, wondering, you know, what we were going to do. And um, as time went on, and they they saw that. You know, they're, that we were not trying to tell them. We were doing what we wanted to do. We weren't telling them what we thought they should do. Um, uh, then, and, and accepted what they were doing, you know, that, that they were doing what they felt they needed to. And uh, a lot of our very good friends are conventional growers, and uh, it's interesting that, that you know, they'll even ask us questions. What are you doing about this problem? You know, because the stuff they're selling me is not working. And, you know, so they'll 
they're, th they look at us more as, as another resource now rather than a threat. And I, I think that's true. I mean, I remember er early on in OFA, we, we'd always have a booth out at the Farm Science Review. And I can remember the early days that, that we'd be sitting in that booth and, and it was like we had the plague because people would be walking down, you know, the little avenue there and looking in all the booths and they'd get to ours and they'd get as far to the other side of the lane as they could until they got past us. You know, and then after a couple of years, they'd they'd look, they'd walk by, and they'd look in, and and maybe say something from the street, and and you know, and eventually, they started stopping in, and talking. So it, it's it's, you know, I I guess we just kind of we're we're not trying to be um, evangelists or anything. We're not trying to. I I always figured that. If, if you you make decisions on what you want to do based on trying to provide a livelihood for your family. And if I tell you, you have to do it like this, and you fail, then you're my responsibility. And I just don't feel comfortable with that. I think, I, you know, people want to ask us questions, I'm happy to answer. But I, I don't feel comfortable telling people what they should do. At the same time, though, it seems like, as you as you mentioned, that early on, organic farmers and conventional farmers were kind of running in different different networks, different channels in terms mm -hmm. of information, resources, who you could turn to. Yeah. Can you tell me more about your life at OFA? What 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 did OFA provide that was useful for what you all were doing, and and how how did you? change your involvement over the years? Um, I'll tell you, the, like, the, the big thing they provided for us was information. Um, compa uh, uh, companionship, I guess you'd call it. Um, family. Uh, if you've ever been to a conference, you know that feeling when you leave, how you're ready to conquer the world and, and the world is 100% right. Uh, it, it's just a feeling you get from being around people that are of like mind and, and, and are all striving for the same thing. And it, it, it's, it's an organization that, that um, has really grown over the years and, and, and is doing such, such good work. I mean, it's just... Um, uh, you know, I, I feel honored to be a part of it. Can you tell me the story of some of the big things OPA was striving for and achieved during the period of your involvement? Were there yeah. particular victories that stand out? Yeah. Um, I'll tell you, when, when I, I said I went to my first first conference, I went back to the the next year to the second, I, and I haven't missed a conference since. But the second year, uh, just again had just an outstanding time. And I got home and I got a call from uh, uh, Charles Fry. Uh, he's on the board, and he called and wanted to know if I would be uh, interested in in running as the chairperson for the organic certification program. So over the course of the next couple months, we talked about that. And then when the third conference came around, I did agree to, to do that and, and was elected to be chair of organic certification for OFA. Uh, at that time, it was a volunteer position. And this was what time? Like um, It would have been, yeah, early 90s. Um, I think we certified 12 people at the time. Um, we, we had one inspector. Uh, there were four, four of us on. I had three other people on the committee. And uh, um, it was interesting. We had our, our, our standards uh, when I started were um, uh, an 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper. 
uh, both sides. Chris, half of the one side was, was the application. And, uh, um, you know, it, it was... It was a much different process back then. Well, I, I shouldn't say it. It was a, a much um, low key, more low-keyed process back then. The process was probably, it was pretty much the same. Um, and if you looked at those standards, it was kind of like the outline for the National Organic Program. Um, it, it, the National Organic Program still follows pretty much what we were doing way back then. Um, and, and I did that for about, I don't know, four or five years. And um, we um, uh, took a big undertaking and, and gathered up organic standards from all over the country. And, and we came out with a new set of standards for Ohio. Um, and they, um, it was probably, mm, instead of just being one page or two pages, uh, was probably more like about 15 or 18, somewhere in, somewhere in there. And uh, it was a little bit more description uh, and depth about, about what each thing meant. And... Uh, also, during those first years, um, we were able to get through an organic uh, standards of identity in Ohio, uh, which, which um, I'm trying to th uh, remember exactly. I believe it was an ex an executive order signed by the governor, Governor Celeste, at the time. It wasn't um, it wasn't an actual bill. But what it said was that in order to, to raise and grow a pro, uh, uh, an agricultural product in Ohio and label it as organic, you had to be certified organic. It did not cover anything coming in from out of state. It was only in Ohio. It had to be grown and sold in Ohio. So if, if you were growing in Ohio and selling it outside of Ohio, you could do whatever you wanted to. And if you're growing outside of Ohio, so in here you could do whatever you wanted to do, but it was a really big step, and it was pri as far as I know, it was the first state in the country to be to have that. Um, and um, and then as time went on, then then the uh, national standards came along. Um, but before that, I, I mean, we it, it said after I did the organic certification for four or five years, it. We were up to, to really big numbers, somewhere like around a, 120 or so, and it was just more than a volunteer could do. So we, um, uh, the board agreed to uh, hire somebody uh, uh, to run the organic program and to pay that person. And we interviewed and... and uh, uh, we hired a, a lady by the name of Sylvia up, and uh, she ran, she and her husband Steve Sears uh, ran the program for a number of years and did so during that whole switch over to the National Organic Program, which was quite an undertaking. So, yeah. Can you tell me more about the, the rise of the National Organic Program and how it impacted you from your experience here at Northridge? Um, Did it make a difference at all? Yes, it did. Um, and and the difference it made it. You know, people people claim that that organic certification is uh, too bureaucratic, uh, too much record keeping. Um, those kind of things are important to. Um, to be able to verify what's happening on a farm. But also, the record keeping that the National Organic Program caused me to do in key terms of keeping track of all of my inputs and keeping track of, of when we do things and, and, and 
what our yields were and what our sales were and all those things made us a much better business. I mean, those were the kind of things that we should have been doing from day one, but we didn't. And a national organic program forced us to do those. So it, in, in, in a lot of ways, it was, yeah, I, I'm not a big keep track of details person. So I needed that push and, and that, that to force me to do that. Um, but it was probably one of the things that, that, that caused um, our farm to, to uh, be more uh, economically stable and, and uh, sustainable. Um, and the other thing people really complain about is cost. I mean, you know, um, when I started doing the organic certification, I think it was $35 to be certified. Um, my fees this year are uh, 950 I think. But if I didn't have that, I wouldn't have the sales I have. And the other thing is, is that there's a cost share program, so I get 75% of that back. That's through USDA? Uh, that's for, through the USDA. So it really isn't that expensive to do. What is your sense from your years of serving in the volunteer inspector or, or the, the chair of the certification committee position? What was your sense during those years of why other farmers were seeking certification? Back then it was more um, a lifestyle choice and making a statement about what you were doing. Um, especially early on uh, before the uh, uh, Ohio standard of identity was passed, was, was, was put in place. Um, that, um, I mean, you could do whatever you wanted to and say whatever you wanted to. I mean, it's like, kind of like now going to say we're all natural. You know, that has absolutely no meaning. So, you know, back then you could say, I'm oh yeah, I'm organic, you know. And, and nobody would, could tell, nobody would know. Um, but the people that were being certified really believed in what they were doing. It was as much of a, of a cause as anything. Um, like for us, I mean, it was something that, I mean, that's the way it kind of lived my life. And it was a statement about that. So we maybe didn't have to be certified that early on, but we chose to be just to, to to make that statement. I'm really curious since you said that, could you share a little bit more about what you do believe and what you did believe in terms of what you put into practice on your farm? What are, what um, are your beliefs about food and agriculture and how you chose yeah. to do things? I mean, it's a whole thing of, you know, like, oh gosh, back in high school biology class and learning about environments and, and, and looking at, 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 at slides of, of microbes in the soil and, and how teeming with life it is and, and how important all those different things are to the earth and to, to everybody that lives here. And, and um, um, it, it's, you, I just have, have, have always felt that you, you don't, you can't just go out there and, and dump stuff on it that's going to kill off, you know, all this life in your soil and, and then expect to grow a plant that's going to be healthy to eat. And, um, uh, you know, and, and it's true, uh, you know, I heard somebody said one time, it, it doesn't matter what you're growing. I don't care if you're raising carrots, I don't care if you're raising chickens, I don't care if you're raising kids. It all starts in the soil. So you have to take care of that soil. And I think that's, that, and that's one of the big foundations of organic farming. How have your practices of tending to the soil changed over the years? Can you like walk me through a timeline of what you did when you started out and where you've ended up in terms of how you 
tend to the land? Oh, on how we tend to the land? Yeah. Oh, sure. I mean, <laughs> when we started, I mean, like I said, we were doing like a quarter of an acre, half an acre, and uh, had a Troy built tiller. And we'd be out there for hours running a Troy built tiller. Uh, we'd put our plants in by hand, mulching, uh, and, and uh, I mean, everything was a hand operation. And it, it took a, a lot of labor. And, and back then it was just um, uh, the four of us, uh, the two girls and my wife and I. And, um, uh, and w we, we did the whole thing. And then as we grew and got bigger, that became even more work. And um, uh, eventually we saw the need that we were going to have to make some changes in what we were doing. And um, one of the, or the, one of the, well, the first thing we did was I, I bought an old used tractor and a tiller and used that, which really sped things up quite a bit. Um, then we located a uh, uh, an old rudimentary m a plastic layer for doing plastic plastic culture. Uh, it would lay uh, a four foot wide piece of plastic down a row um, for you to lay it and bury the edges, and um, uh, found that from a neighbor who was who used to use it and wasn't using it anymore, and so I was able to pick that up. Um, and then down, you know, uh, I think the first brand new thing I bought was a, uh, a, a transplanter, a uh, water wheel transplanter. And um, that really made things much easier than putting everything in by hand. I mean, it made, you could plant in a, in a day, which you could plant in a week, you know, so it, it really changed things. Um, but then, yeah, just we kept adding little pieces of equipment to do this and that. Um, did your staff grow as well? I'm sorry? Did your, did your staff grow? Yeah, and that, and that was probably another big, it was all during that, during the early part of starting to gear up with equipment-wise that we hired our first um, uh, employee. Um, and... Uh, uh, we hired a young lady by the name of Laura Weiss, and uh, she worked for us for, I don't know, three or four years. And uh, that, that was huge, uh, having that employee that came in and helped every day. And eventually we got to the point where we had uh, uh, five, at least five full-time employees and maybe a couple of part-timers also to help with other things but um, um, and then we added high tunnels when that technology kind of came along and the season extension and and uh, uh, various other things but it, it, it uh, like I said it, it, it was constantly kind of changing and, and uh, you know changing what we did we, 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 we had different kinds of livestock at, at different periods, uh, early on, we 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 raised the uh, um, uh, meat chickens and had them as part of our rep rotation for fertility. And you know, but then you know, started looking at the amount of time that required and how much we could actually sell them for at the end and that we were making, you know, maybe 50 cents an hour doing that. We decided that probably wasn't the best use of our, our time. Um, you know, we had, uh, our youngest daughter was in the sheep business uh, when she went away to college. I think we had 60 ewes, and we'd have, you know, 100 plus lamb, lambs every year. And, and that was actually a good side business. Um, especially for her, paid a big part of her college. Um, but then when she went, went off to college, it became dad's responsibility. And so over the course of like three years, we went from 60 down to zero. 
and uh, culled the herd and, 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 and got out of the sheep business and, and then back to just doing straight produce, which is what we were good at and it, it's what our focus was. Can you tell me about some of the highlights of the vegetable crops you grew over the years? Are there any like standouts that you really were in love with? Um, yeah, you know, tomatoes are always going to be near and dear to our heart. I mean, that's, uh, you know, I, I, I always, I always tell people in the spring, even in the greenhouse, when you're starting the plants and, and you're starting uh, a variety and it triggers a flavor, um, you know, it just makes you think about what that tastes like and uh, so those are always something that, that are going to be near and dear. Um, one, one, <laughs> one we grew for, for a few years, um, uh, patty pan squash. I mean, we'd, we'd grow zucchini and we'd grow summer squash and we grew patty pans and we couldn't give them away. I mean, we'd eat as many as we could and then we'd feed them to the sheep and you know, and people just wouldn't buy them. And, and so, you know, my wife would always say, quit planting them. Nobody wants them. And um, I said, okay. But then the next year came around and I couldn't help myself. I planted some. And, and we had them and we got to market. And it just so happened that that year, uh, Country Living ran an article about patty pan squash and how good they are and how you can use them and do all this different stuff. And we were the only one at market that had them and uh, we just couldn't pick them fast enough. So um, yeah, there's al always all kinds of neat things like that that happen over the years that, that really um, uh, kind of make it fun. I always, just for us, for me personally, you know, you know, like growing eggplant. I mean, sure, you can grow the big purple bells, which is what you're going to sell the most of. But then we also grew white ones. We grew pink ones. We grew the 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 Japanese varieties, the long, thin ones. And, and it just makes it so much more fun to be out there in the field. And and that that's, that's as big a, a part of the life's uh, life on the farm is anything. So, what are your primary crops right now? We are now growing just one crop. We're a monoculture. Um, <laughs> we we are growing uh, butternut win winter squash. Uh, this is our third year for just doing that, and uh, what we we've, we've cut down to one third of our growing space, and then the the other two thirds are are just our fallow and soil building. Why butternut? Um, have a very good market for those um, uh, through the restaurant trade in Columbus. Um, probably 90% of them go to the North Star cafes. And um, uh, it's just a, it's a crop that allows us to uh, plant in the spring. And so we've got about uh, a two to three week period and from about the first of, of uh, May until like about the 20th or so of May that we're very busy. Uh, starting, we, we put transplants in. So we're getting the fields ready, we're, putting the, we're starting the transplants and we're planting. And then after that, uh, go through and cultivate a couple times with the tractor. Um, and then they start vining and they grow all summer. And so we get to travel a little bit. We get to spend a lot of time with our four grandkids. And uh, then in the fall, we harvest, put them, we have storage here for them. Um, I think we, we harvested 25 ton last fall. And uh, it's, it's all just my wife, Laura, and I. And so we don't have any employees. Um, we go to farm markets as consumers. 
and get to visit and talk. And uh, it's fun. It's for all those beginning farmers listening out there, you can you can make a business just off butternut squash if you know what you're doing. You, you <laughs> can. You can. Um, you know, it, it's not... <laughs> On a, on a square footage uh, basis, it's not the um, the highest, um, the most money you can make per square foot, uh, but it's a very easy crop, which is what we were looking for at this point in our life. I wanted to ask you, back to the moment when you were talking about transitioning to having employees for the first time, I'm really curious about the educational channels by which folks coming into farming learn this type of agriculture. Did you guys play a role here as, as teachers or mentors to new farmers? You know, we, we have over the years, you know, we did not, um, we're, I, I was very adamant with the people we brought in here um, that this is not an internship. It's not a... Um, I'm hiring you as an employee. What's the difference for you? The difference for me is if I hire you to come in as an apprentice or an intern, then what I'm doing saying is that a, a, a big component of your being here is going to be education. And I'm going to need to put together some kind of a manual. We're going to have study time. We're going to have tests. We're going to, you know, we are, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to teach you the business from planning and paperwork and, and marketing and business plan and, and all these other things, you know, mechanical repair, all these other things that you, that you have to be able to do in order to grow a carrot. Um, you know, so... Sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> it, and it is. And um, I just didn't... I mean, I looked at what other farms were, were, were doing with a program like that, um, and I just felt that they were not doing justice to it, and they were not being honest with the people that were coming in, in, onto their farms on, and to be an intern, because they were paying basically nothing for this education, which they really weren't getting. So. Uh, we just, we, we, we told them, you know, we're going to pay you. And will you learn while you're here? Absolutely. Because you have to learn how to do it in order to do it. And we're going to spend a lot of time in the packing shed working. So you have questions, ask. And we'll talk while we're working. So that was how we handled it here. And, and I'll tell you, we had, over the years, we had uh, just some incredible people work here. Uh, young people come through, young and old. And, and uh, you know, some of them have uh, uh, kind of like become our adoptive children and are still very good friends and come out all the time and... and uh, um, they, I mean, we, ju we, ju we were just so lucky with the caliber of, of employees we had. Uh, just, it, it, was, it made it so much easier. I'm curious, with the folks you had over the years, young and old, what led them to seek out employment on an organic farm? You know, um, we had a few uh, that had this idea, idyllic, uh, idea of what it meant to work on an, on an organic farm and, and some of those didn't last very long. We had one that didn't even last a day uh, oh, no. because and, and then we really started stressing about how hard the work is because it is it, it's, it's hard work and it doesn't matter if it's raining or if it's you know 105 degrees we have a certain thing that has to be done today and it's got to get done. And, um, you know, so it's, it's, it's hard work and you do it in some extremes sometimes. Um, but we always tried to make it fun and, and always tried to make, make the, the day schedule work so that you weren't being stressed out too much. And, um, 
Uh, but a lot of we had we've had a number of people that have gone on to uh, start their own farms. Um, we've had a number of people that they just wanted to see what it was like to work on a farm, and they wanted to, to work on a farm for a summer. School teachers, um, students, you know, and, and and you know, and they were looking for an experience. And, and got that. Um, had one employee one year that um, he, uh, John Skaggs, he, he was a chef at North Star. Uh, now he and his wife, Kimberly, own heirloom uh, restaurant at the Wexner Center. And uh, John called me up and said, are, are you still putting a crew together? for working on your farm. And I said, yeah. I thought he had somebody he wanted to recommend, and he said, I'd like to work on your farm this summer. And I said, John, I can't afford to pay you what you're going to pay. He says, I'm taking a year off, and I want to learn what it takes to grow the food I make. And so he came and worked on our farm for a year and did a great job uh, and, uh, and made us some great lunches. And... Uh, uh, went on uh, back into the chef world and, and uh, has done great things there. So, Have you seen the reasons that young people especially seek out work on the farm change over the years you were involved from the beginning to the end? Uh, boy, not, not entirely. Um, um, you know, year to year it might shift um, from people wanting experience, people wanting to learn more about so that they can grow their things for themselves, or people wanting to uh, learn how to farm so that they can start their own farm. Um, and it might be heavier in one area than another year to year. But that, that was a lot of... Um, we never seemed to get the person here that was looking for a paycheck. With the wrong line of work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have to ask you, many of the folks I've been talking with so far, you know, are small family farms who are taking on one or two or three employees. What was that dynamic like, being a family unit and then having folks coming in from the outside working with you in the business? Um, well, we, we kind of made that transition over to... Um, employees as our children moved on. So we didn't, I mean, there was a little bit of overlap there, but um, uh, our, 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 our having a, a larger workforce here never really occurred until after they were gone. Um, although they, you know, always, you know, kids always come back and spend a lot of time with you. Uh, which is a great thing, and, and, and got to know and become good friends with a lot of our employees, too. And um, um, it, it um, uh, it was a different dynamic uh, from the standpoint of, of you know, when, when it was a family-run thing, uh, we were smaller, and, and that probably had a lot to do with it, but it seemed a little bit more low-keyed. Uh, when I had employees here, then, then okay, and they start at 7, which means you start at 5.30 to make sure everything's ready for them to start at 7. And then when they're done at the end of the day, um, they, they leave, and then you do all the cleanup stuff at the end. Uh, that stuff that needed to be finished off. So um, uh, the dynamics of the whole thing changed, but um, uh, it, both both ways were a really good experience. Yeah. I'm curious if you could tell me about any particular challenges or obstacles you faced throughout the life of the farm. Yeah, probably the. Uh, the, the 
the biggest, especially on an organic farm, is weed control. And um, early on, like I said, we'd try, we'd, we'd mulch. I mean, we'd get rotted leaves and, and spoiled hay and straw and, and try to try to mulch. And, and the, the biggest problem is, you know, you might be able to keep up with that while things are growing. But then when you start harvesting, then harvest takes a lot of your time. And you have less time to do the maintenance. And so by the end of the season, weeds were a, a major problem. So um, converting over to the plastic culture um, helped a lot. It's still, uh, there's still a lot of um, um, manual work trying to uh, keep them in check in the rows in between the beds. Um, and tried all different kinds of things uh, with various uh, success. But um, uh, that is prob probably the biggest problem area. Um, we did have one year where we, uh, when the uh, late blight hit Ohio the first time. What kind of blight? Late blight. It was a, it's a, it's a bacteria, it's a disease that Come affects, um, it, it makes these, it affects the tomato plants and it's, um, puts, makes these lesions on the fruit itself and on the leaves and, and actually kills, kills the plant pretty quickly. And, um, like I said, I mean, we had, uh, you know, thousand, couple thousand plants in. And, and uh, there were, it had never been a problem in Ohio, and they started talking about it, and nobody knew what to do about it. And um, um, the, uh, uh, there were some plants, infected plants came into like the big box stores like uh, uh, for sale outside that had uh, late blight on them, and it's a disease that, in in the, in in when the conditions are right, can travel airborne for like ten miles. So it didn't take long before it spread across the whole state of Ohio. And I remember finding, I mean, that year we had perfect conditions for it. It was, it was damp, high humidity, um, and uh, I remember doing our first harvest. And seen a couple lesions on the plants in the in the packing shed on a Friday, and I said, and I went out and looked, and I said, I think I've got late blight, and so we did market, or I I called Ohio State Pathology, and they said dig up a plant and bring it into us, and on Monday, and I went out there Monday morning to dig a plant up, and it had went from one corner of the field to the entire field. And took it in, and they said, yeah, you know, it, that's what it was, and it it wiped out our whole harvest for the year, um, which was a big hit for us. But uh, you know, that's why you grow a lot of different things. That's why you don't just grow butternut squash, <laughs> you know, because if something happens to that one crop, then you're done. How did you recover from something like that? Well, you know, it, it always seems like every year. Something will do really well, something will do really bad. And we had a lot of other crops that did exceptionally well that year and uh, didn't quite make up for the loss of our tomato crop because that's one, one of your big sellers. But it, it made, we didn't lose money. So that, that was a big, big plus. Yeah. I mean, again, like I said, that's why, that's another reason why you don't, you know, you plant multi different types of things. And, and when, like when you plant cu cucumbers, you don't plant one variety of cucumber, you plant six. You know, I know it looks that way when you're driving down the road and you see 200 acre cornfield, you know, oh gosh, look, that's corn. Well... But it, it is, but more than likely, it's it's ten different varieties of corn. 
uh, because you know they know what happens too. Now, I'm really curious. You mentioned towards the beginning that you had a whole separate career and life and in, in social work. Yeah. Did that carry through while you were running the farm? It did. <laughs> Can you tell me about that balance? Because both it, of those it, have it, like full-time it, jobs. It, uh, <laughs> it was more like a nightmare. But um, no, we would. Um, um, uh, I worked full time. My wife worked full time as a nurse, and um, uh, you know our kids, of course, were in school. So uh, we'd get home at you know four in the afternoon and and uh, work in the field. And, and and do our growing. Um, we harvest stuff, get it written, go get it packed up and ready to go. Um, I'd get up the next morning and load stuff up in a truck and leave for Columbus at you know like four o'clock. And I'd make my deliveries to restaurants and and uh, then I'd go to work and come home and start all over again. Um, and. Uh, we did that for quite, quite a few years, probably ten years. Yeah. Why both? Um, you know, I uh, uh, although I do have a lot of um, very liberal tendencies. Uh, financially, I'm very conservative, and I just couldn't, um, I couldn't make that that jump. I couldn't make that leap leap of faith. To give up a paycheck and benefits and 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 do the farm. Um, so um, I I did continue working and, and retired, and uh, and then the farm really took off at that point, and um, and and we run the farm totally separate from any other income, and um, and it is something that that come to, to, to learn we could have we could have done um, it made it made a little change and well it made a big change in our our lifestyle because we'd have been working a lot on the farm <laughs> instead of just in the evening we'd been working all day but it would it would have um, uh, it would have changed things up a little bit but it, 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 it it's definitely a possibility what do you see as being the future of the farm next 10 years for our farm yeah um you know um my guess is that uh 10 years from now uh we will still probably be here but probably not growing anything um probably um have a neighbor making hay, something like that, uh, on 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 our property. Um, just you know, getting to the point to where we don't have the uh, demands on us as far as um, children here and and expenses and that kind of thing, and we have a, a, a much greater demand on us from grandchildren of wanting us to spend more time. So do your grandkids live in Ohio? We have, we have two that are down, one and two year old down by Buckeye Lake. It's about a half an hour. And we have a five and a six year old up uh, outside of Cleveland. And uh, so, like I said, that's what we we we, we kind of split our time during the summer between the two, uh, go up north and then down here. But um, uh, I think we're probably gonna very shortly um, uh, make that switch and 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 be able to free up all of our time and uh, and and do do a little more traveling too. Are you concerned about succession and someone? taking over and continuing farming on this particular piece of property? You know, we, we, we tried to make some, um, to see if we could make that happen. And um, it just never panned out. It just, for a variety of reasons, uh, it didn't really work. And, and I think part of the problem too for us is that, you know, this, this is our home and, and, and we do like it here. 
uh, so we're not real excited about leaving. Um, but um, uh, two, uh, two years ago, when we decided to cut back and um, uh, go to just growing the butternut squash and getting rid of all the tomatoes and, and eggplants and lettuce and all that other stuff, um, you know, one of the one of the things that bothered me most about all of that was felt that the reason we were successful and the reason we were where we were at was because of our customers, both at the market and and at the restaurants. Um, you know, we've got uh, at the restaurants. I mean, even we've even got people that work in the restaurants that come out here. That, that they, you know, we've gotten to know them. So it, it's, I really felt bad about just showing up one day and say, hey, it's been great, thank you, we'll see you. So, you know, that was part of the reason of wanting somebody to, to kind of take over the farm. Um, but what we ran into is we found um, uh, two other young individuals that were kind of starting farms and, and uh, had, had started and wanted to really grow. So we turned over um, all of our sales contacts and uh, our, our tomato seed bank and all that kind of stuff and, 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 and gave it to them and helped them and helped them out in the first year getting, you know, working through all that. Um, and and they're carrying that on. So I, I, I although I really miss the customers and um, that whole social part of it, uh, we still get to see a number of them when we go visit the farmers markets. So I, that's kind of nice. But I, I I don't feel we left them in the lurch. So yeah. What do you think your legacy and Northridge Organic Farms legacy has been in Central Ohio's organic food and farm movement? You know, I, I, I just hope that it's, that it is that uh, uh, good, flavorful, quality food uh, that uh, we made mealtime better. I think that's that's probably the big thing. Is there anything you haven't gotten to share that's been a, an important part of your experience in this work? There's yeah. so much to say. Um, no, just like I said, it 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 it's it's mm -hmm. been a, uh, uh, a life and a lifestyle. I don't think I'd ever give up. Uh, change. Um, We've, we've made so many friends because of it uh, around the state, around the country. Um, it just, um, uh, you know, through organizations like OFA um, are just really making it so much uh, better. Um, I, I, I look at the possibilities today and would have not would never have dreamed that the that they'd be available um, 30 years ago when we started I mean it just uh, the markets are so much stronger and so much better um, there's so many different avenues uh, for growing for what to grow for what to do uh, artisan cheeses and uh, value-added products and, and, and all that stuff, it just, um, uh, you know, uh, I just, just wish we were young again. How do you feel about the future of the food and farm movement for yep. Ohio? The food and farm? For, what, how do you feel about the future for the organic food and farm movement? Ohio, right there. Oh, I, I think that's that's very strong. Also, um, I think that um, uh, there's still there's always going to be a lot of work to do. Um, 
I, I think we've got a. Uh, I think Hofa is is um, very is in a very strong position uh, financially and with our our staff that we have. Um, you know, when when we started, and I mean, Ofa was nothing but a, it was a grassroots um, um, volunteer organization. You know, the board ran everything. We did it. We did it all. Um, it's still a grassroots organization, but you know, it it it's grown to the point we have staff that that um, are doing so many more things. That, that need to be done. Um, and there's a lot of things that I'm sure are going to need to be increased and, and uh, we'll con you know that the, the organization will keep growing uh, and to meet those needs. but um, uh, yeah it's, it, it, it's I, I see a very bright future. Are there things that really concern you looking ahead in terms of what organic farmers? or all of us are facing environmentally or in terms of food and health? Yeah, I, I, I think the thing that bothers me most is uh, the, the, the big money that, that's out there working against um, uh, the things that, are, that, that we do, the things that are important, trying to uh, convince people that uh, what we're doing is no different than what they can do in a lab, um, you know. And I, I, I think that's a big, uh, a, a big thing that that the organization needs to continue to do is to educate and um, uh, uh, the you know the people and and let them, you know see what the truth is and and just keep plugging away um but uh yeah I, it, that's the part that really bothers me probably the most is when you know people decide okay we're just going to make stuff up and and put it out there You're talking uh, gmos that kind of thing? yeah well gmos and even even you know like uh you know the, the the health and the benefits of, of eating eating organic instead of uh, a conventional I mean it just um, you know in in at least in my mind uh, to, uh, like you know we talked about the soil and I think you know when you when you when when we we look at our soil and we need to amend it we're, we're looking at not only the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, we're looking at all the trace elements and, and micronutrients and making sure that it's a balanced living soil so that it's beneficial to all the microorganisms. And there's a lot of things you don't have to apply because they're there in the soil. They're in a form that's locked up, which is why you need those bacteria and microbes to break them down and make them available to the plant. In conventional agriculture, where you're just throwing urea and, and hydrous ammonia on it, and you're growing these big plants that are very green, that look good, but the soil's dead. And so they're not getting any of those trace elements and micronutrients. And that's where the flavor comes from. Uh, you know, it's a difference of of, of, you know, having something to eat that, that, that has, that is just fiber and something that is, you know, a well-rounded, has, has all kinds of nutrients and, and, and it, uh, it just affects it in such great ways that, that uh, uh, I think that's just the, the focus we need to keep on. Last question for you is, are there things you see happening in Ohio in terms of organic farming and food that make you really hopeful? That make me hopeful? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, see, um, I see a lot of um, younger people get into farming. Um, 
you know, I said when I went to that first um, uh, OFA conference, um, you know, Mick Luber and Harv and I, and I mean, we were the young pups back then. Uh, not so much anymore. And uh, now we're starting to get a lot of young people again. Uh, we always have had over the year, but there was, we're really getting a big influx of young people getting involved and wanting to grow things. Um, the whole urban agriculture movement um, is really spurring that along and, you know, and, and, and growing some very wonderful products um, in a very dense uh way in, in, in cities, and uh, um, I, I think that's going to be incredible over the coming years. Um, it's st still going to need farms out in the periphery, and, uh, and we are getting, you know, younger people that are starting that up too. So, um, you know, I, I, I see a lot of reason for hope. Um, as, as we're sliding out on the back end of it, uh, uh, doesn't mean we're going to stop eating. So. I think I lied. I have one more question. Okay. So, given what you just said, um, I'm curious what you think, young or old, what do you think that new farmers coming into organic agriculture in Ohio, what do they need to know about your generation? What you guys fought against, what you accomplished, what you believe in? Oh, gosh. I don't know. I, I, I guess the, the biggest thing, you know, would be uh, being a good steward, um, taking care of... Of, of what's given to you, um, of being honest, of, of, you know, with your customers, um, you know, uh, if you make a commitment, you follow through on it, that kind of thing. But I think the biggest, uh, the biggest thing is, is, is taking care of, uh, the environment, taking care of the earth and, uh, uh, leaving it in a uh, in a better condition than you found it. That's great. Is there anything else you'd like to share? Uh, no, I think I'm good. All right. Well, once again, we're talking with. Here's my chance to pronounce your name all the ways you don't want. Mike Laughlin. Yes. Okay, Mike Laughlin, and we're out here at Northridge Organic Farm. Yes. Okay. I always say farms, and I've been corrected several times. Everyone's like. I've just got one farm. Yeah, we're just one place. So, Northridge Organic <laughs> Farm here in Johnstown, Ohio. It is May, no, it is June 1st, 2016, and this is being recorded for the OFA Food Farm and Movement Memory Project. Thank you for listening.